In the name of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. Amen. Amen. This week brought the unexpected gift of an email from Joseph Hughes, who is a professor of economics at the State University of New Jersey, otherwise known as Rutgers. He wrote to offer some kind words on a sermon that I preached a while ago, but mostly to compliment all of us on the high quality of the worship services that we offer from here on the internet. It turns out that Joe Hughes watches us very early in the morning before going into the city to worship at St. Bart's, where he's a member, a place that at least a few of us here know. Mary Haddad certainly does. So thank you, Joe, for being with us. And thank you to all of you who are joining us from wherever you are around the world as we gather here every Sunday morning, Paris time. We're thankful to have you with us, even if we are just an appetizer on the way to St. Bart's. Wherever you are, let us know how you came along with us and how you found us to be part of your faith journey. We are now out there on the internet. We wonder how these things can be, but we are very glad that they are. I've chosen for my text this morning the five words uttered in midnight perplexity by tired and troubled Nicodemus. They are words well worth writing on your heart, because in them lies the beginning of wisdom. Remember a little bit about Nicodemus. He is no average person. He is exceptional. He would fit right in here. He's highly educated. He's highly respected. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. People come to him for knowledge. He knows what he thinks and he knows why he thinks it. Most men in Nicodemus' position, and at this time in history they were all men, would have nothing to do with Jesus. They already knew what they thought of him and why they thought it. They were quite sure they were in no need of any further information. Not so Nicodemus. There is something truly wise about Nicodemus because there is something truly humble about him. Humble enough to make him aware that there is still more for him to learn. He hasn't given up what he thinks. He isn't any less sure of his own ideas. He is just prepared to admit that his own knowledge might be incomplete. And so, Caught between curiosity and reputation, he comes under the cover of night to Jesus. I sometimes wonder whether if we open the gates here in the small hours of the night, at least some of the people out there living in such certainty about their secularism might bring their questions here under the cover of night. Anyway, after the exchange he has with Jesus, we just heard it when Nat read the Gospel, Nicodemus does not say, you're wrong. He does not say, I am sure my knowledge is superior to yours. He does not say, none of this makes any sense. Instead, he weighs all that Jesus has said to him and all that he knew coming into that room, he sees that both things cannot be true. And he also sees that what Jesus has taught him might just be true. And his response is a prayer in the form of a question. How can these things be? Today is our feast. Today is the Feast of the Holy Trinity. It is the one day in the calendar of the church year dedicated to a doctrine of the Christian faith. The one day that the person standing here must speak to you in some way about theology and make it interesting. Because the idea of the Trinity is a theological claim. 
But for 2,000 years, as people have tried to explain this and expound on it, as the libraries have accumulated shelves upon shelves of books about the doctrine of the Trinity, most people outside the Christian church, and more than a few in it, have responded in something like the same way. How can these things be? How can we claim to believe in one God expressed in three persons? How can we claim to be part of the Abrahamic family of faith that proclaims God is one? How can we say in the words of the very first of the 39 articles of religion that God is three persons of one substance, power, and eternity? Theologians from St. Augustine to Dorothy Sayers have taught us to look for traces of the Trinity deep within ourselves in human nature, because after all, we are made in the image and likeness of God. And so that seems promising. We'll find some evidence here until you try it. And then, as Augustine himself found, you get no satisfactory answers. So we struggle with this idea. But we might just be missing an easier path, although it is a more dangerous path, too. That path begins in a different place. Instead of starting by looking inside ourselves, start instead from the fundamental Christian claim about the nature of God. It is simply the assertion found in the first letter of John. God is love. Theos agape estin. The impact of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus was so profound on the people who had experienced it that this was their conclusion. God is love. Not that God is the source of love. Not that God is like love. That God and love are two ways of saying the same thing. And when the world around them heard them say this, their scandalized response was, how can these things be? God is judgment. God is righteousness. God is wrath and anger. That is the God we know. And even today, it is the God that more than a few Christians seem to prefer. But here is where our story begins. God is love. We already know that. So what might we learn from that about the Trinity. More than anything else, even more than our faith in the resurrection of an executed convict, those three words are the most radical claim of the Christian faith. And they are not just a claim about our faith, but about us, about Christians, because we are taught that we are to love one another as God has loved us. That is what makes us Christians. Love each other without self-interest or self-regard, without condition, and without hesitation. There is a glimpse of a different trinity. God's love toward us, when we really embrace it, spurs us on to love others profligately. Which is why, more often than not, we are afraid to do it. And when we act in love toward others, we inspire them to turn toward God, who is the source of the love they have received, a trinity. Our ancestors in the faith wisely saw that a God who is love could not possibly be monolithic, because love is inherently relational. So our claim that God is a trinity is a direct consequence of our higher claim that God is love. Because a loving God must be eternally in loving relationship, the perfection of which is the love between creator, redeemer, and sanctifier, the love between the speaker, the word, and the action. So what about us? If we are the cathedral church of the Holy Trinity, what does this tell us about us? or about who we are called to be, and what purpose 
God is calling us to, expecting of us. Whatever else it is, it must be this. We must be a place that transforms the world in love. We must be a place that creates intentional, reconciling, courageous, risk-taking love. We are meant to be in relationship with the world outside. And it must mean this as well. We cannot be true to ourselves. We cannot be true to the call God has given us unless we first treat each other with that same love. Now, my brothers and sisters, don't be alarmed. This does not mean we have to like each other. I still think of myself as new, but I know I've been around here long enough that at least for some of you, I am on the list of people I don't like. And that's okay, because I've been around here long enough that I'm beginning to have a list too. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. We are supposed to love each other. Regardless, that's the dangerous part. Here in this community, whatever the rest of our lives are like, whatever it's like where you work or study or stay at home, we are supposed to put others here first and ourselves second. We're supposed to show mercy and forbearance and understanding. We are supposed to rejoice together, to weep together, to strive together and to serve together. They are not options. They're not frills. Those qualities, those virtues are what we are called to be as a church named after the Trinity. Because the Trinity is the truth about a God who is love. If we fall short of that standard, then we change nothing. We help no one. And we become a cultural institution in a church-shaped museum. But if we do respond to that call, we will change the world into something more like God's dream for all of us. We will do it in ways that we cannot now possibly imagine. If we do respond to that call, nothing is beyond our grasp. A few weeks ago, I quoted from here Fritz Bauerschmidt's little book, The Love That Is God, and talking about how our Christian responsibility calls us to be friends of the risen Jesus and what it takes to be that kind of friend. When it comes to our life together, our life here in this Trinity Cathedral, what that is supposed to look like, the love that we are supposed to share with each other is the love of true friendship. Here's how Bauerschmidt describes who we are called to be. True friendship must involve a kind of forgetfulness, both of any benefits received and any gifts bestowed. Friendship must somehow involve both a single-minded concern to seek the good of our friend with a profound sense of gratitude for what we receive from our friend all the while ignoring how much we have given and how much we receive. In this way, true human friendship dimly reflects the even more mysterious mathematics of divine human friendship in which God gives the creature everything. The creature gives the neighbor everything. And God rejoices always in this exchange of love. In the calculation of God, I somehow owe everything to the needy neighbor from whom I have received nothing. How can these things be? Are we those sorts of friends to each other? Can we become more so? What would we unleash on the world if we were? For us, those of us who have named our community after the Trinity that expresses a God we claim to be love, 
That is who we are called to be. So no matter what has come before, no matter how glorious our history or how hurtful our mistakes, let us be that church for each other and for the world. And then our God, who is love, will be seen and known through us. Amen. Thank you.